Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know if you not, does not know, do not know me. Um, so, um, for those who don't know me, I've been in business 11 years, and when I started in the business, I was on a, um, a team that was very buyer heavy. I was a buyer's agent. So, like, I mastered the buyer consultation, like, mastered it. I mean, I, my success rate in getting a buyer agency side, I don't know what percentage it is, but it's probably 95 plus percent of the time I get. If I, if I go through the process and get master the buyer agency, I'm going to get it. Um, and so, I feel like I've got enough experience to, to teach this. So, um, the, the thing with the buyer consultation is, um, I'm gonna, what I'm going to go through today is going to be more of like from a stance of if it's a newer buyer, like I'm, uh, an inexperienced buyer, or that sort of thing. But you know, the, the thing you got to think about is who is your audience, who is the client, and what 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 a value can you bring to them, right? So somebody that's buying their first home um, needs to hear different things than the person that's that's invest, you know, that's buying investment properties, or somebody that's bought and sold a lot of homes in their life. So um, so when you when you are going to do a buyer consultation, you need to like really think about okay, what what a value can I bring to this buyer when I sit down for the buyer consultation, right? Because there's general stuff. Yeah, you're going to recap and you're going to do all those things, but what a value can you bring to them? Um, and so the buyer consultation is really your opportunity to build a rapport with that client and get them to to trust you. You get to know them and understand um, number one what their personality profile is, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, and then what's what's important to them, right? Like how you're going to win with them, because you're you're when, when I go in and work with a client, my goal is to make a client for life. I have built a business on with that mindset, right? So you want to you want to speak to them, you want to earn their respect and trust, and you want to be able to speak, you know, meet them where they are. Does that make sense? Um, so the buyer consultation is going to give you that opportunity to really understand who they are, what's important to them. And then you know how to basically work with them go forward. Um, so do you, are y'all familiar with disc profiles? Everybody? No? No. Okay. Um, so, so there is a, um, and, and look, the office can send you a link to take a disc profile. It is a super cool tool. tool. And what I'll, are you saying? The disc, D-I-S-C. Okay. Yeah, and That's it's personality that. profile, right? So D-I-S-C. A high D is somebody who, like, they want the facts. They don't want all the fluff. Give me the numbers. Get to the point. I don't have time. Like, they don't they don't need all the details, right? Um, somebody who is a high I, like, you're probably a high I. She's got, and you probably are, too. Your bright colors. Like you're, they're kind of the life of the party. Like when they walk, when you walk in a room, you know, like they're really outgoing and um, they're fun to be around and they're jovial. Um, so that's usually a high eye. What's that? Yeah, I mean, well, I too. you can usually pick them out because yeah. they have all bright colors a lot of times, and um, they might have a hat on, a fun yeah. hat, you know. Uh, so anyway, and then a high S is somebody who is very steady. They're, um, they don't like a lot of change. They're going to need a lot of information. They're going to have a little bit of trouble making a decision. You're going to kind of have to really help them along. And they have a fear of being taken advantage of. So buyer consultation is super important for somebody that's high S. I have a friend that I'm working with right now, and that is so her. And the thing is, it's, it, I think it's something like, 90% of our, of, I don't know, I, think, I guess it's you, uh, um, Americans, I don't know, I guess it's Americans. There's a high percentage of the population, let me say that, population, high percentage of the population are high S's. I am not an S, so I'm not in that percentage. I can't remember what it is, but it's a high For high a percentage. seller, the high S's have a lot of pillows. Pillows? Even that pillows are really big in the house. They're the people that have real pillows all over their bed. And, I like pillows. Every time I've taken the desk profile, I'm almost negative S, like I have none. Um, and then um, a C, a high C is usually if they're an accountant or an engineer or something, mm -hmm. something like that. Like they're probably, if they say, well, I did a spreadsheet, they're a high C. <laughs> they like all the data, they want all the details, like they're, um, they're skeptical, but once you give them the data, they'll make a decision. They might take a while to make a decision, but once they feel like they have all 
all the data they need, they're comfortable making the decision, right? Um, all right, so this is not just class, but that's what it is. But so a lot of times, if you really look at just profiles and understand, a lot of times when the clients come in, you can I can figure it out pretty most of the time what they where they fall in the disc profile just by things they say um, and things like I was within a our consultation um, late last week and he came in and he said um, he said now I'm a, I'm the numbers guy okay and I was like well, great you know what do you do for a living he said I'm a mechanical engineer and I was like I see he's gonna have his spreadsheet and that's what he said later on he said now I'm gonna do the whole do my spreadsheet and I was like great let me know what you need I'll help that with that. Anyway, all right, so so the, the, the buyer consultation is your opportunity to really understand what, what kind of personality profile you're working with so that you know how to adjust to what where they're what they want, right? Um <coughs> so we probably should do it this class. We should. I wish Deborah Fish would come back from hers. Did you go to hers when she did it? Two years ago. We had a really nice profile like an update class. Um what website do you all use for the thing? I'm not a, a double check with Jen because I'm not 100% this disc is Able something that they will just give out here. I don't think you're right now. It's not like the KPA, we don't have a membership. Yeah. It comes from JD. So it might be. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Able Slim is, like is the, Tony Robbins has a free one that I'm telling you it's not great. Like if you can get, it was not, but it's not even that great. The Able Slim one is the best. That is the um, bad one. Able Slim, A B E L S O N. Able Slim. Um, I have a friend that's in that group. She teaches the disc class. Um, she's in Maine, and I think she pays an annual fee. I'll ask her if she can teach a class. Yeah, she'd do it over Zoom 100%. Yeah. Um, she's a high eye, so she's going to talk and it's going to go off in this direction. Usually, high eyes are kind of like all out. Oh my gosh. That is so um, <laughs> and I love her. She's one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, anyway, um, she's Kate and Angie Maine. Anyway, so um, so when you go into those, so let's get to the buyer consultation. When you go to the buyer consultation, um, I'm a I'm a high D, so I just like want to dive in. And if they're not a high D, they're not going to appreciate that. So you really want to take them and you like to get to know them, right? So one of the things um, to remember is four F O R D. So family, occupation, um, recreation, recreation. Thank you, and dreams. Um, and you don't have to say. Tell me about your family, you know, but like those are the, the reminders. Like, you want to ask them, like, tell me about you guys. What do you what do you enjoy doing? Like, is there something, a hobby that you guys have that the house needs to lend itself so you can kind of tie it into why they're there? But you know, ask them, you know, what they do. You may know some of that before they come in, but um, really take a minute to kind of get to know them. Um, so any questions on that? So family occupation, um, recreation. Dreams. And I don't say, well, what are your dreams? You know, but you can ask questions. Right? <laughs> it's not easy to but anyway. Um, <clears throat> oh, let me go back. I, I have this nice downline. I should just follow it. Um, so going back to build rapport, I talked about that. Educate the client and then um, <coughs> and set expectations. That's a big, big, big piece of the fire presentation. You really want to set expectations of what they can expect from you, the process. Um, you know how they're going to work with you. You know, you might say, hey, "Look, I don't, I'm not available after 5:30." You know, it's setting those expectations, um, and setting the expectation, expectations up front prevents um, them feeling insecure on the backside or them getting frustrated about something on the backside if they know what's coming. Especially if like it's a high S personality or a high C personality, but and even a high I, the expectation is a part of it. All right, so the forward is the first step. Um, and then you want to go into um, probably a little bit of the market, like where the market is. Um, you know, if they're if you know they're coming in to look for a single family home in Foley, you might want to bring up some of the stats on what's sold and what's available in Foley. Um, <coughs> <coughs> but then the other uh, part of that is to talk to them about being a salesperson versus a consultant. Um, and so this is one of the pieces where you're going to educate them and you're kind of get to where you're going to, at the end, you're going to have power consultation. Um, you know, and tell them, look, um, there's a different salesperson. They're going to open the door. They're going to try to sell you the home. I'm consultant. The purpose of us being here today is that I can understand your needs and wants and what your goals are so that I can help walk you through the process and get you to the end result with exactly what you want and the confidence you want. So. And you're telling them you're a consultant. 
Yes. Yeah. 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 Just a look. Salesperson, you can find a salesperson. They call any records you can. You find a salesperson. You guys will go to the door for you. But I'm going to go way further than that. Like, I'm going to provide you the data. I'm going to listen to what you want. And I'm going to really help you locate what it is you're looking for. <clears throat> and be your advocate. <clears throat> Um, and then talk about the market, buyer's market versus the seller's market. You might want to pull up the stats. Like if you, like I said, you know what they're looking at. Um, and then you, you want to, pull up, I'm sorry, did you pull up your own set or do you use like RPR or something else? I just pulled MLS. Okay. Just pull up, you know, you can pull up assets and get sold. And um, there's a CMA summary. If you've ever, you've never ever used that tool, it's a really, it shows kind of breaks it down, average day for market. Thing. So there's tools within MLS. I don't do a full on. Yeah. Um, and then you want to talk about, you know, so the, here's what we're going to set an expectation. So we are shifting into a, a buyer's market. So we're kind of like in this like weird phase right now, but um, you want to talk to them about where we are in the market and where we think it's going. Um, and then you also want to talk about supply, you know, like, hey, uh, in what you're looking for, there's this many homes. And um, you want to talk to them about um, the list price to sales price ratio. That's super important because Sellers haven't 100% grasped that they're going to a buyer's market. There's some buyers that really, they're like, oh, yeah, 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 I can get so much. You want to talk to them about what kind of discount buyers are actually getting. So if they think they're going to go in and offer 10, 20% below the list price, and I'm just picking a number, but the average list price to sell price ratio is, let's say, it's probably around 3% discount. Like, set that reality for them. Like, we're going to look, whenever we find the home that you want, we're going to look at comparable sales. And we're going to decide what we think that home's worth. And look, I want you to show that on average, homes are getting about a 3% discount off the list price. So just set that reality that if they think they're going to go in and offer 10%, if it's priced right, and they're going to offer 10% under the list price, they're probably not going to get it. Like the, the seller may not get so that's, it. That's part of the uh, set the expectation. So before you even go in there, you need to have that in your mind. Yeah, um, like, you know, the, the buyers are getting on average a 3% discount in the homes and probably what we're still looking for. Is that realistic or do you just say that? I mean, uh, is that real? I'm, I'm just saying. Well, I haven't pulled fully specific okay. stat, but yeah. I, I, Does I it say, say that somewhere that I can see you that? The stats and it'll say that. It'll give a percentage. Okay. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm doing it. Okay. Can you pull stats? Because I'll look at it. I don't think it gives it. you the percentage, but there's a way to pull um, that gap, and it will show you like the average sales price. Last and then you month figure the average yeah. sales yeah. price this you month. Figure. Yeah. Okay. You can do it for three years. Yeah. Up to three years. You might not do that for five. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what would you how recommend? Far how far back would you go? Well, right now, right now, right now, two months. Yeah, that's what I was saying. <clears throat> and then, um, so any more questions on what kind of, so you're, you're helping them understand the market, where it is, and then you're helping set the expectation of when it's time to write the offer, what is going to be a re reality of writing that offer. Um, <clears throat> and then you want to talk into, go into pre-approve. A lot of times I try to have somebody pre-approve before they walk in the door here to meet with me, but if they're not, you really want to talk to them about the importance of the pre-approval. Um, and so the benefits to them, cash buyer leverage and confidence. So cash buyer. So the way I would explain it to them is that, hey, whenever we put an offer in on a property, um, we're going to stipulate that is contingent upon financing. And the first question that the listing agent is going to ask me is, are they pre-approved? And if I tell them you're not, they're not going to ne necessarily take your offer seriously. Like, you know, and I'll, I'll validate, you know you can get the money. But the people on the other side don't know you. And um, and so in, in putting an offer and you know, submitting it with a free approval letter, you know, to the buyer, it doesn't I mean to the seller, it doesn't make you cash buyer, but it gives them that more fuzzy, almost like, okay, they've taken the steps. We know that somebody has said yes, you can get the amount of money um, that you're, you know, to get the money for the home. And then it gives you leverage, and the leverage would be piece of it is if there's somebody else that's offering and they haven't done the pre-approval, but you have whose offer do you think the seller's going to lean towards, right? So it just um, gives you leverage in that um, in that aspect. And then the confidence piece of it is just to tell them, look, it gives you the confidence to know that every time that I show you that you can buy, because we're not going to look at anything that's outside of what you're pre-approved for. 
Any questions on that? I think so. Um, and then um, the next section, we move on to benefits of the fire agency. And you tell 100% of my clients to choose fire agency, and that is 100% accurate because they're not applying if they have it. Um, they're not a client unless they sign fire agency. So 100% of my buyers choose my, uh, my clients choose fire agency. Um, and you can go into some of your stats at that point if you want. Um, I don't how long have you been in business? Do you have stats yet? I got just been. No, I don't have any. I've just been in my business for long, about two months. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I guess the office staff, because we have somebody with the office staff, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm just kidding when she has gone. I'm a jokester. <laughs> That's fine. You can joke all day long. <laughs> my husband's a jokester, so I probably have to take his joke. Um, uh, who should have a class of personal average list price? So, at this point, you might want to talk about some of your stats, you know, just kind of depending on your confidence level there. Um, and then I tell them the buyer is to notification system. Look, so if um, once we go through this buyer consultation, I will have a complete understanding of what you're looking for. And if, if I'm representing you, if, if you are my client, um, I'm going to make sure that you're notified within an hour of any property coming on the market um, that matches your criteria. And that's super easy. You just Go set it up in the MLS, yeah, for an immediate. Um, so, um, <coughs> and then the big part, then you go into the big part about the buyer agency is I can answer you know paragraph versus a tenant. So what I explain them like, if I'm not representing you per our license law, I can provide for you what's in the multi listing service. I cannot pull comparable sales. I cannot advise. I cannot give my opinion. Right, broker. Um, <laughs> uh, but I can't, I'm really, I'm told my hands are tied in terms of the services that I can provide to you. So, as if, I, as if I'm fully representing you, if I know it, you know that, if I know it, you're going to know it. Period. Um, so. um, <clears throat> I'll never forget this. This is a funny story. So, I had a client, y'all, I mean, it was from the First business. I mean, I bought a house when I know with me, probably 2012, 2013. And he's a really high C personality. And I still to this day remember sitting in that fire consultation with him. And um, he was very skeptical. Like I was not going to get that fire agency. And I kind of got into that and I saw the wall kind of start to come down. And um, when I got to the end, he was like, Yes, like I need that. Okay, so let's fast forward to last week. I did a, a client event, and he was at the client event. And he was talking to my admin and he said, I, because since then I've sold up, up his son, I've helped him purchase a home and then I'm working with his daughter now. And he said, he told my admin, he said, I don't really like people. Like I don't trust people, but he said, there's not a person in the world I would trust more than Heather. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, and, I, and it's funny because I remember sitting in that conference room at the old dinky office we had on the beach road. Like that was 10 years ago. But I still remember. So, so there is a value to this, right? Um, um, let's see. Um, buyer agency. Any questions on buyer agency? <coughs> when you said that um, you set the expectations and there's some things that your hands are tied that you can't do. So per our transaction, in I mean, you're still broker at the moment, so. Right. So le legally, yes, the paperwork has not come through. <laughs> uh, you can't, if you're just a transaction broker, the biggest thing I see is I don't tell my, tell my clients, I can't give you any advice. I can't say, I can hand you like these properties sold, but I can't say based off of what these properties sold as, I would, you could probably go in with an offer like this because that's advice. You can't give advice. Right. All you can do is say, look, these are the prices these houses sold at. What would you like? Oh, yeah. So you you you're, you can't fully represent. I got you because it's because of the fact that we're a buyer to our state. Right. I got you. I have another question. Sure. Sorry. You mentioned something about getting instant notification. So in our MLS, you can set up a contact, and then you can set up a search, and you can like, but do you want them to be notified like immediately? Which we oh, okay. said, do you want them to be notified of new listings once? A day? Okay. 
you said yeah. the parameters um and one of the things that you get pushed back on somebody signing um and they're like well i mean i should get into notification you know you can um you can say that that well if i have a client that's looking for this type home and they've committed to working with me but you have not who do you think i'm going to call first to tell them about this home it's kind of a really direct if you're like in the hotel you can be laid out that way well somebody who's not an agency it's almost like they don't really care they don't in a sense they don't really need an agent they need somebody right really all you're doing is writing a deal for them. yeah yeah so um so in here you don't really when they sign with the buyer agency agreement what do you talk about your commission or you don't or you just put it in there and then just not talk buyer to agency we don't well there's a spot where you can put your minimum commission yeah mm -hmm. it is a um it is i i get to the, i get to the actual buyer agency <coughs> at the end after a good just let people recap the buyer agency and I'll be honest, I don't. You don't. I okay, don't. that's what I was going to say. And that's probably, a, it's a limiting belief on my part. I 100% have the value add to somebody. Mm -hmm. I just don't. Don't. Okay. I got you. You're saying you don't put a percentage in there? Mm -hmm. It's not very safe. Obviously, that's not very safe. I know. I know. For example, if they were to go meet with another realtor and write in an open house, you might zero in there. Yeah, that's true. You, you can't be protected. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Broker can't do anything. So you need to put at least a minimum of something. Three. Honestly, three. and when we get to it, I might tell you guys more what I say, but I always put three. I tell them it's not it's not well, necessarily well, I when I go through it, they do the three percent, they kind of freak out and I say, Well, usually the seller, we can't say we work for free, we'll pay it. But if I ever show you a property and I'm not okay with the commission that's being offered, I'm gonna let you know before I even show you. So that's you'll have a heads up. Okay. And honestly, I don't charge my clients the difference. I could if somebody was offered one percent. I may come to my buyer and say, yeah. look, I'm okay with two. But to protect myself, I just do 3%. Because yeah. yeah. okay. I feel like if I put 2.5 and I get offered three, is there going to be any loophole where the buyer thinks they're going to get money back, potentially? Oh, yeah. 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 So I just put three, and I don't get much pushback. Yeah. Okay. That's all how you say it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do we have one of those in this frame book? Yeah, there should be yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um all right, so any any other questions, comments on buyer agency? No. Okay. Um so then uh, I move on to talking about fit bows at open houses because there's nothing worse than your customer calling you up, client calling you up and saying, Oh, I went to this open house and I loved it and I had the right to offer. Yeah, you did what? And some like the Horton agents are great, and they'll ask, they'll ask. I had a, he's passed away from cancer, but I had one that great. Oh man, he was everybody he was, loved him. I didn't, he, he I didn't work on him. I him a little bit. He was such yeah. a nice guy. I had yeah. people show up, and they were like, "Well, we worked together." And he wrote it. He called me next day. He was like, "You've got a contract." I was like, "That's what I would do." What? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so you want to educate them about open houses and fit Um And so what I tell them is, look, you're going to be out riding around, you're going to be looking on Zillow, you know, if you see an open house, go in, check it out. But when you go in there, you tell that agent that is there, I'm being represented by Heather Lundmore. I said, you don't even have to give them your um, information. Um, and, uh, and I said, look, the, the great part about that for you is you don't have multiple agents around town blowing your phone up trying to get your business like i'm your agent you just tell them i'm your agent and they'll funnel anything back through me and then i um tell them the same thing on fizbo it's like if you see a fizbo or a sub owner that you are interested in call me first let me gather the information um you know i will set up the appointment to go see let me make sure that the seller is willing to pay a, a commission to the buyer's agent i tell them look Nine times out of ten, the, the seller is, and I, I do find that a lot of for some owners are willing to pay buyers agent fee. Um, and and they just don't look. Then you've got representation um, through the process. So you just really want to um, add us on that. And then the other part you can say on that um, attorney versus agent. So the other thing I tell them is <coughs> the other part about a for sale owner 
And I will say this also a lot of time, in my opinion, the are overpriced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will tell yes. them that yes. the reason they don't have an agent is because they want too much for it. And probably most agents told them that it's overpriced, you should take it. But the other thing is, is I tell them, look, Alabama is a caveat in tour states, but our state. So it is in your best interest to have some sort of representation if you go through that process to purchase that home. And if it's a for sale by owner, if you don't have an agent involved, I would highly advise you get an attorney. Well, guess what? That attorney is going to be paid by the hour, and they're going to get paid whether it closes or not. Um, if you if you have an agent representing you, there there is no payment made until your transaction closes. And they'll say, well, what if they won't pay by as agent being? Well, then that's the discussion of, well, if they don't, and it's a home you really want, um, and you want that representation, it might be a three percent, and you would pay it at closing only if it closes. Um, versus if you hire an attorney, it, you're going to have to pay whether it closes or not. <coughs> and then it also that I talk about going to new construction, you know, say the same thing. Look, the, the agent on site represents the seller. You want your own representation whenever you go into those um, new homes. Just make sure you tell the agent on site that you, you know, they represented by Heather Lambert. Any questions? One of the things that um, that you can do is you can give them several business cards and say, look, if you go to these open houses, just give the agent my card and just tell them you've got an agent. Um, that's one of the things you can do. Um, okay. All right. All right. Here's the big piece. Setting the expectation on shopping for homes. So who has had a buyer call them up and say, ready to look at homes here are the 14 homes i'd like to see yeah 25 yeah yeah and so and then in a lot of times if that's a personality type that like they need a lot of data they need to feel like they've seen everything to feel like they're making a good decision um here's the conversation you can have with them the average home, the average buyer looks at five to six homes before finding the right home. Okay, good. They've got that, that in their minds, five to six homes. Um, if you have fully conveyed to me what it is you're looking for, I know what's out there. I know what's on the market. And a lot of times I can narrow these homes down to the best matches for what you're telling me you want. Now, if we go to look at five homes and none of them have hit the mark then we need to sit back down and reevaluate what it is you're really looking for right so um it's setting that expectation up front and i'll tell them look if you've got 15 homes that's great let's go look at the five to six best ones and if we've missed the mark then let's go to the next ones and let's let's evaluate those and again sit down and let's talk about what you're really looking for what your needs and wants are um <clears throat> Um, where I run into a lot of trouble with people is uh, our pushback is, you know, I do a lot of beach properties and people come in for the weekend and they're coming to buy a condo and they want to look at every two bedroom condo that's on the market. <laughs> Again, it's the same conversation, but it's 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 with us a little bit more difficult because they've got a very short amount of time to try to see things. But um, the other thing to tell you when you're showing property to buyers, um, I would not. It makes makes sense to go, okay, this one's the closest, and then we go to that one, and then we go to that one, that one, you know, make a path. Really, what you should do is pick the best house and show it first. Pick the second best house, show it second, the third best, show it third, so on. So from a psychology standpoint, the buyer goes in there like, oh my gosh, this house is great, we love it, it's everything, blah, 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 blah. And then I think, right, well, let's keep this one on the list, you know, let's. What do you want to rate it? I'll watch it. Don't jump to rate it. Well, out of five stars, what do you do? This well, it's a four and a half. Great. There's no five star, by the way. Don't tell me that. <laughs> um, and then, and then I, I, you go to the second one. They go, oh, well, this is great. I really like this one. But you know, yes, maybe. Okay. Well, what do you rate this one? And so they start seeing. Okay. The further out we go, the less, the, the less we like the homes. Yeah. And a lot of times, after a few, they'll go, well, let's go back to that first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, don't work every time, but it is uh, a good tool to have in your tool belt. <clears throat> um, uh, that said, on setting that, oh, and the feedback. So I always tell them to, you know, ask the rating, and then you know their feedback is super important. Um, because if if you have missed the mark and they're not liking anything that you see, a lot of times 
it's because they didn't even know what they were looking for, right? They thought they did, but they really didn't. And so um, getting them to give, give feedback helps you, and then it also helps them self-discover. And I will tell you, couples um, sometimes can be super hard because they are not on the same page. And that's, <laughs> I've had some tough conversations with husband and wives before. <laughs> like we've seen a lot of homes, we got to get on the same page here. The part about starting your um, off with conversations with them, you figure out who's the. Yes, in the consultation, you find yeah. out who the decision maker is. Yeah. Yes. That would be, yeah. Yeah. So when you when you want to go back and reevaluate um, what they're looking for, is that after you show them like five houses or yeah? Like so you might say, hey, um, Mr. Register, so you know we looked at these five homes. They, I mean, what you told me you that you had to have what you told me you would like to have, like it checked almost every box, and and yet this home doesn't work for you. So let's. Get back together, let's grab a cup of coffee, maybe in the office, whatever, and let's sit down and let's like really talk about why what's going on here. Like why is what you thought you needed and wanted really not matching up with what you are discovering you really need for. Does that make sense? What about pricing? Like somebody tells you <coughs> 300 is their budget, they can't go any higher, and everything they give you, you know, for 10,000, you know they probably can. For ten or fifteen thousand more, they can find the dream home for if they just cross a little bit of a threshold. Have you ever tried to? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so if you know they can, if like I would just have a really there, right? bright conversation with them, like, hey, this is what you're telling me you want, and you're saying you want to spend three hundred, and if you go to three fifty, like I can get you exactly what you want. Um, are you willing to do that? If they say no, okay, well, what are you willing to give up on your mm -hmm. list to get to that 300? Because you're going to have to give something up. Were you going to ask something? What's your name? Mylon. Mylon? Yeah. Were you going to ask? No, I was, I, I'm, I'm zoning in. Oh, okay. I hear what you said. I was bold. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I was bold, and then I realized I had overcommitted myself, and I just backed myself up. We really needed you. Our numbers are so low. You was on my team. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I get the text message one way. Um, yeah, I felt bad for talking. I've done the old five or six times, I and I just I overcommitted myself. I just something had to give, and it was either that or go to Austin, Texas, to uh, Keller Williams International, like Mastermind, and I was like, I don't want to go to Austin. <laughs> um. Anyway, um, all right. Uh, did I answer your question, Brad? Yeah, but yeah, I get a lot of them that, and I get it, they can't truly afford it, I understand. Yeah. But you know how it is, it's really sometimes, okay, they're telling you what this, this, and this, and if we say, I don't want to go over X, well, I show you X really quick in a dump, or just for this little board. Yeah. Tell me what you wanted, you could get there. Well, you know? and I've said to people before, actually, I just sold their condo again. They bought with me like early on in my career. And I remember having a conversation with, I can't even remember that name yesterday. And I can remember they said, it's so weird to me. I remember having a conversation that I've showed them several condos and it just wasn't meeting her standards. And I was like, if you will trust me and you will be willing to expand your budget a little bit, I can take you to the, the condo that is exactly what you want. And he said, yeah, let's do that. And I think it was maybe, I don't know, 50 over where he was, his budget was, I don't remember. And I took it to him and they bought it. So, I mean, you just have kind of that conversation, like, if, if you trust me and trust that I'm an expert here, I, I know what you want, and I know it's about 30000 over your budget. Can you evaluate, can you guys talk and evaluate if that's what, what you can do? Because it, I can get you on exactly what you want if you can fill up for the And hey, by the way, on the mortgage, it only makes this much difference a month. Right. Right. Which was an easier sale a few months ago. Those the mortgage price went up. So, um, buyers that have kids. Okay, that's one of them. They kids. Okay. Good. I have kids. I love kids. Right. You know. Sometimes they control their. Yeah, but if, if 
the person on the other side is still in the house actually does not want it. Or may have antiques, old antiques in the house. They don't want, you know, little kids to be around and touch them. How do you just, do you just tell them, look, we're, we're about to go to the house that's kind of, yeah, you know. Tell them, look. Just, and look, if you're worried, if they have kids and you're worried about them going along, show it. Maybe you say something like, listen, I know you want your kids involved. Um, some homes that we go into, they have value rooms and things, and they may not, you know, you can't, well, I say that, but you got to be careful because, um, it, uh, is it antitrust law? What is that? Um, Fair housing. Fair housing, yes. Yeah. I mean, I would probably, all, and I haven't had this problem, I've had one really kid that jumped on the couch and I was like, oh my gosh, you should yeah. not to bring your kid. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're worried about it, you could say, um, sometimes it's easier if we go look at houses, yeah. just you two, and so then, we don't get the kids hopes up, and yeah. then we can bring them back to, to the, the to top the one or two with their yeah. two oh, that's a good yeah, way that's, to there you go. I know, you're not even about like saying, hey, they might break anything, it's just more, then you could focus, because I know how it is as a parent. Yeah. yeah. And I, my, I'm distracted from my kids around, running in every room. Okay. I'm like babysitting the kids, and like trying to keep them off the furniture and things like, hey, yeah. <laughs> and you never know who has cameras. I've been taking some broker calls where people had their kids that were touching everything and messing things up, and they had on camera. You know what, though? I just tell people just assume that they have a camera. Well, that's There's what I was room. about to say. Show you, and that you can do that in this consultation. But just tell them you, you just need to assume that every house you go into, they've got cameras on the inside and outside. Oh my gosh, I went into one the other day. They had cameras, they had four cameras in this tiny living, I mean, they were, it was creepy. They were everywhere in the house. It was creepy. And she started, my clients started saying that, and I was like, and I just found her like, yeah. I was like, we'll talk later. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah. <clears throat> all right. Um, all right, so shopping for the home, that's great, stripped. Um, ask them. Um, and then if they're like a new uh, buyer or you know, an inexperienced buyer, you can give them a copy of the purchase agreement and say, hey, you know, we're going to go ahead and go through the purchase agreement so you understand what is in here so that when it's time to write the offer, like we can get an offer put together, you know exactly what you're going to be signing and you know exactly what I'm going to need from you. So um, you can go into that um, at any point during the process. Um, and then I talked to him about earnest money and I said, look, you know, in Alabama, um, we, you're not required by law to, to put up money in good faith, but to the seller's perspective, they want to see that you've got some skin in the game. Now, listen, we're going to write the contract so that your money is protected. We're going to have contingencies. And yet it is a good idea to put some form of earnest money up as, um, as good faith in moving forward to purchase. My recommendation is one to 3%. You know, they're always going to go with 1% almost always, but. Um, and some people are just going to say, no, I'll give you $1,000. Well, I was going to say that was a deal. That's what it was. It was even 500% way back when. But then a thousand years percent. It's, it's, I see 1% a lot. I'm really? That's I tell them they are up and up so part no less than a thousand. You're not going to take this home off the market for 500 Yeah. I said a thousand. If it's a first time home buyer, they probably don't have a lot of like extra cash laying around. And so they might only feel comfortable. And that's fine. But again, it's just setting that expectation up front that like, hey, this is going to be expected of you. This is the amount. You know, if you can't do that amount, let's talk about that right now. Like, let's figure it out. <laughs> if they can't spread for a thousand bucks, they may not be worth a thousand. All right. Then we're going to go into like the contingencies of the contract. Again, setting expectations and helping them understand what those contingencies, the purpose of those contingencies are. So inspection, I tell them, look, inspection is for major items. You're gonna, the inspector's gonna pull out everything they can find because that's their job from small to large, aesthetic to non-aesthetic. You know, what we're really looking for are the major items that are currently an issue are potential major items down the road, like um, an air conditioner that's really old or, you know, old hot water heater or water leak or whatever. Um, and, and it's just setting that expectation that when they get that inspection report back, they don't go nitpick the sellers for stupid stuff. Yeah. stuff. They will look at the report and they'll go, oh, look, this whole page of things that we call that. Yeah. 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 Correct tile, they're not going to, if they have extra tiles, they can't. If that's aesthetic, you saw it when you, you could have seen it when you went in the house. Are you going to say something? No. Oh, okay. Um, 
So um, that's all inspections and appraisal. You know, I tell them like after the appraisal, so after the inspection, so we're gonna have a, the, the lender, the finance is gonna have it appraised. The great part about the appraisal for you is that you know with 100% confidence that you're not overpaying for the home. Um, you know, tell them it's gonna cost you about $650. The lender will tell them collect that from you. Um, and then, um, and I'll tell them, look, if, if something happens in the home, the appraisal does come back and it is low. Um, and I talked to them about the, what their options are. You know, you can, we can renegotiate the price. You can choose to pay the difference um, or you can walk away. So. <coughs> then, you know, I explained to them that after the appraisal is done, then it goes back to underwriting, you know, and it's kind of quiet um, until you get the final loan approval. And that's when, you know, you celebrate because you're going to close them. Um, and then I explained to them that we do closings at title companies here, that they will need um, a valid driver's license or um, passport, you know, a legal um, document. Um, and then um, I talked to them also about wiring their down payment, and I, I do talk to them about wiring fraud. Um, you cannot talk to your clients enough about wiring fraud. Y'all all know about wiring, wiring, wiring fraud. Okay. Um, because it's happening, and it's happening, it's happening locally, it's happening a lot. It's pretty bad. How? Um, so the instances I've seen, um, the, the thieves that are probably sitting in Egypt or somewhere, they're intercepting emails that go out from the title company. Mm -hmm. They're changing the wiring instructions. Then they're sending it on to the oh to the person, making it look like it came from the title company. Very very similar emails. I mean, like and the, the, the unsuspecting letter. person, uh, okay, I got my wiring instructions, they go send the money, then they go to the title company, and they're like, well, we don't have your money, and they start checking, and they find out they sent it to who knows where. Um, I had Betsy McKinney tell me, they had one that went to, to a lady was buying a house, I think she said Peninsula, she lost 250000 I don't know if she ever got it back, I doubt she, this was several years ago. But she said that the thieves went so far to call her and pretend like they were from the title company. I yeah. actually got a call before my um, last closing from the title agency that was, hey, contact your buyer and tell, let them know. You'll, they'll receive a call directly from us. We'll be able to verify before they send because of yeah. wiring issues or that are see, going on. Well, I would this not do year. that over a call from the title company. Oh, know. no, she was just saying she was going to call to give a heads up that it's going to come from this email. Okay. With these instructions, and this is what the email yeah. exactly says. But yeah, so what I, I tell people is before you send that wire, either you or the bank or whoever send that wire, needs to call the title company directly. When the person answers the phone, say, call to verify instructions, they'll know exactly what you're doing. Verify what you have and they send it on. I mean, I, they send them through secure systems now, so that's helped, but I still don't trust it. And, um, and and I'll tell them, do not use a phone number that is on those wiring instructions. Either Google and find the title company's email, find the, find, well, find the title company. Yeah, I've been mm -hmm. stuff before and it's, it's fraud. It comes up as if it's what's supposed to be in the top. You Google a company and got a fraudulent company? Well, I'll tell them to either go, go to so it or call me. Call me. I, I can give it to them. Yeah, yeah, but sometimes they don't. They don't. They don't call to. Um, but I just tell them don't use any numbers that's on the email I got or the wiring instructions. The email with the wiring instructions or the wiring instructions. I just saw the other day. It was like hundred eighty thousand dollars. It wasn't in this area. It was up in Indiana where I'm from, and they lost their whole entire. Was oh my gosh, scary. And then they had to back out of the deal because they didn't have any money to pay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, it's what she said. So, anyway, it's what we talked to them about the um, uh, bar problem. All right, and then. Um, you know, then you got to go into, you know, my goal for you is to get you the best price to use fastballs in the time frame that you desire. You know, it's that's the reason we're, we're sitting here today is so that I understand what your goals are and can help you achieve that. Um, and then you want to ask for referrals that, you know, say, listen, my business is built on referrals from happy clients. And so all throughout the process, I'm going to ask you, you know, who do you know who's thinking about buying or selling that I can help? 
And um, and I also will ask for her on Dr. Cassell. I mean, my goal is to offer such a service to you that you cannot imagine sending anybody that you, um, if your family or friends, to any other agent in town. So, um, that's the, and then it go into repat of ours. <laughs> Which one are you supposed to repat the front part? But. So, what questions or comments? What's you, what are you doing with someone that's reluctant to sign a fire agency with you? Ask them why. What, what, if, what, what question marks do you still have around the, myself and the services I provide? Like what, what makes you hesitate? And I have, I have asked people to leave and not work with them. Maybe about three or four, but I don't know. My time is worth way more than running around opening doors for people Maybe, yeah. and then they'll go buy something for somebody else. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm not going to do that. I'd rather be the one to get to my service. Um, but yeah, I just try to uncover why, <clears throat> what the objection is, and then answer the, the objection. I was going to ask, what is the time frame that you're spending with your clients on your home bar computation? And um, what's the pre screen that you're doing on the phone before they actually come in? So, um, um, this is. Um, a questionnaire that you can get them to, to fill out like before they come in or you can go on the call with them or when they come in you can ask them to fill some of this out um, on this questionnaire. <clears throat> I don't use this questionnaire anymore. I just kind of get through it. Um, so wait, what the, the first part of your question was the time, yeah. how long the consultation takes? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm just saying. It depends on the client and how many questions they have. Um, I mean, I would say on the low side, 45 minutes, if they have a lot of questions or you get really deep in the conversation, you might go an hour and a half. Um, but I would say an hour is an average. And then what's your plan of action? They signed the agreement. How soon are you going to look at homes? Are you leaving there to go look at homes? Are you scheduled? Potentially time? leaving right then going to look at homes. Yeah, if I've already gone through their needs analysis prior to them coming in. Um, and it depends on the client, right? So if it's somebody that lives locally, yeah. And they're available at any time, you know, you might say, okay, yeah, you're starting the whole process. Why don't you come into the office? Let's sit down. Let me get to really understand what it is you're looking for and what your, your goals are. Um, let you kind of interview me and make sure that we, we decide we want to work together. And, and so that's just a true buyer consultation. So then at the end, you decide, do we want to work together? They sign, you go, great. Now let's, let's, let's pull up the MLS and let's talk about properties or let's get you in contact with a lender. And then let's go see properties. If they're not pre-approved, you obviously don't want to go show properties yet. So it depends on what their time frame is. And like, so I work with so many people that are out of town. Like when they come in, like we've already got the pre-approval. Like I've already got the properties picked out. Like we're we're right. on it. Yeah. So that's okay. what I was going to ask. Kind of going along with, do you do anything different, different for yeah. out of town or out of state people that are looking to buy, move here permanently versus uh, buy investment property? Any different? Or residential versus. Uh, yeah, they're all different. That's why I said when I get, came in here, like your buyer consultation has to speak to what type of buyer they are. Um, and we can spend all day, like, okay, this is you know what I do for a condo. I teach a condo class. I don't know if I don't know if I don't know why. Um, I mean, with the, with somebody coming in to buy a condo, I'm doing a lot of education around condo and condo ownership. That's what I'm I'm doing the bulk of my consultation on. Um, if it's somebody coming from out of town to move here, like I would have already figured out, like what's their motivation? Why are they moving here? What's the, what is the lifestyle they're looking for? Because that's why they're moving here. If they're moving here from Indiana. They're they're after a lifestyle. So I'm trying to understand some of that. It's more than just, it's more than just three bedrooms, two baths. It's like what are, right. what's their dream? Like there's a dream that is motivating that move more than likely like they are reaching retirement age they're empty nesters like we've dreamed it we're going to be we can we work from home now like i will say this there was a lot of people during covid 2020 i had a lot of sales people that i've been talking to that, that like it was their five-year plan their five-year plan became immediate plan because they were now working remotely yeah so was there something else you were going to ask about well i was going to say um <clears throat> obstacles sometimes 
you know, they have that dream and that plan, and they say they want to buy it for investment, and then it's their personal life kick in, even though you told them up front, you know, you got to remember this is not your second home, or this is not your permanent home, this is investment, and you get to see in all this, and then you're back to the drawing board again. Well, and it's just a really straightforward question you have for them, like, mm -hmm. what's your number one goal in my business? And I'll ask that in the buyer consultation room. If they say it's your investment, great, we are we're not going to worry about like, is it pretty? Is it not? Like, we're going to look at what I know is going to be a really good sound investment that's going to have a good return. Um, but if it's, they say, well, you know, we, 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 we want to bring our grandkids down here. We want a place, but then we want to rent it, you know, to, to help offset the cost. Well, then, you know, they're really going to be more like, this is the property what they want. Does this mm -hmm. speak to them? And so you got to understand what the motivation is. And then if they start getting off of that, Bring them back to like you told me. Like, has your has your has your motivation changed? Because this is what you told me. I can tell you, and, and then also like we'll take the furniture. Like, we'll go in places and we'll like, oh, that's so fun. And I'm like, that can be changed. Do you like the view? I know. Right. Do you like that view? Because that can go. That can. Yeah. Yeah. The location can like, change. Yeah. Yeah. Because they'll start getting caught up on the stupid stuff. Yep. Paint. Yeah, like that can change. Yes, it's going to cost you money, but we'll take that into consideration with the offer. And it's, you know, you can rent it how it is. We just think you can do every time. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell, I'll tell people like something in our consultation. They're coming down to buy something that's <clears throat> an investment and or their, you know, kind of second home investment. I'll tell them, look, nine out of ten condos, you are not going to like the decor. It's going to be worn out. It's going to be beat up. You're going to want to put your own touches on it anyway. So I just go ahead and set that expectation. Like, you're going to spend money on it when you buy it. So if you want that, like, turkey, you literally drop your bags. There's, like, three options out there. I mean, and you got to spend $50,000. <laughs> Do you have any luck with people that are out of town buyers doing, like, videos? Like, walk through the video tour? A ton of our tours. Yeah. Um, I saw a lot of properties outside of me. Do you get if their fashion person or do you just do it with yourself? I'm on FaceTime, I'm on WhatsApp. I did one yesterday, I said, um, uh, which one was the one that I Um, I got in the other so I had to be on it. Um, uh, so a lot of times it's a second home, and so there's a, a little bit of pressure off of you when you do that virtual. I mean, you want to point out everything. You don't want them to come down to, to closing and they go in there and they go, well, gosh, you didn't show me this or that. I mean, if you see something that's a, a default, even if it seems minor and stupid, you got to remember they're not there. So you've got to show them, like I, that, that, that virtual show I was at last night, I could see where they had scraped furniture across, like the floor had some indentions in it. Well, it's not bad, and I, but I pointed out to them, I said, look, up, it's here, I want you to know it's there, you can see it when the light hits it. The floor's not scratched. I can just see an indention where it looks like something heavy went across the floor. And we'll get a show that. There we go. But you don't want them to come down and go, gosh, you didn't show me all these scratches in the floor or whatever. So you really have to like be their eyes and show them everything. <clears throat> um, and then I've done some virtuals for people that were some primary residents. That's a little bit nerve wracking, but it's worked out really well. What's your follow-up like with um, clients who are out of town versus here? Um, I mean, I would assume that it's probably more and more demanding because you're their eyes and you're everything for them yeah. being here, their representative. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you just, it, it kind of depends on where you are in the process with them, right? So if it's somebody I haven't met with yet, we're not doing it, but they was at a consultation on our agency, I'm just staying in touch with them. Um, depending on what their time frame is, if they're six months out, I'm probably touching base with them once a month, or give them 25 days. Um, <laughs> if there's somebody I'm in buyer agency with, I'm you know every morning I'm looking at the listings that I mean listing that the last. If I see something you know if it's something like I really think it's their property, I'll call them like, hey, this just came on the market. Um, but if it's something that I think they'll like, you know, I might just email them. But it's probably on a trip just email to them anyway. But um, just kind of like more into the process with them. Um, I will tell you if they're out of town, um, it's. 
doesn't always work this way, but if somebody comes in town and they're super motivated to buy and, and they don't find it um, and they leave town, sometimes they go a little bit cold. Yeah, you know, it's really trying to like, well, when, you, when can you get back to the town? When can you get back to town? You know, talking, trying to set. Um, and whenever you're working with a buyer, I will say this, never leave with them without a plan going forward. Like when you're leaving them, let's say you're in the last house, like, okay, this is what we saw, this is what we like. Okay, so I'm gonna call you tomorrow or we're gonna talk this time, like have a plan in place on what's happening next. Never leave it just kind of like up in the air. Um, so. Another question. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. Something else. <coughs> this is your chance. Yeah. I know, yes, right? Yes. <laughs> 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 you can ask me anything. I have a question. Yeah. What if you have um, a buyer and there isn't going to be a contingency of them selling their house, but they don't need the financing because they were cash buyers on the house they live in? And that cash will pay for the moving. So you can't show funds as the money being there, but then you don't have a contingency of a loan. So this is probably more for a question, but I tell you how I do want. So in the contract, I would put that it's cash, and then I would put in the additional provision. So if I'm representing the buyer, there's two ways to go about this. If I'm representing the buyer, how I'm going to handle it is I'm going to put in the additional provisions. Um, offer is contingent upon home located at 123 Main Street selling on or before whatever date, but especially if it's under contract, right? So you want to put a date. And then you could put proof of funds will, will be provided upon uh, sale of house or, or something, something like that. Now, and I'll tell my buyer, look, this is what we're going to do. So what this does is it really ties the property up for you. They can't keep, keep with a contingent upon sale addendum, a first order refusal addendum, we'll talk about that in a second. There's a, there's a kickout clause or a, a first order refusal clause. So some agents will accept it. I'm like, great, <laughs> right? We just tie that house up. Um, but more, but I tell them, look, if, if this is, and if it's lessons I know who the agent is on the other side, I'll tell the buyer, look, we're going to present it this way, but I can tell you we're going to get probably this addendum back, and this is what it is, and this is what it means. And if you don't know what the contingent upon sale addendum is, I would advise you to pull it, read it, get with Yachty or Aspen or Jetson Pierce, you know. Um, understand what it is because more than likely if it's a it's a, a seasoned agent on the other side you're probably going to get a counter with that addendum. What's um, the name of the addendum again? Contingent upon sale? Oh just yeah just, yeah yeah if it's your, if it's your, if it's your listing a hundred percent protect your seller <laughs> like I'm dealing with that right now uh, we had a contingent upon sale and they presented it with it's contingent on their house and met the selling and I counter back with the first right of refusal, well, guess what? We have a backup offer now. We put the, the first right of refusal into place. Um, they had till five o'clock yesterday. They did not reply, so I sent them a termination this morning. And now my buyer, once we get the termination signed down, the agent's claiming she never saw the email. I emailed her, I called her, and I texted her. And I have read receipt on my email, and I know she opened it within 10 minutes of me sending it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so now my buyer, who is like so ready to get to North Carolina to, to their family up there, <coughs> that we have a that we have a cash offer that now, because I put that contingent upon sell addendum in there, they're able to move on to me. Does that does that you follow me? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. They just have to be prepared. If you prepared, set the expectations that might come back that way, they can lose <coughs> the house and they have to go back. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would definitely. I mean, it's tall when you're working with buyers and sellers. It is about setting expectations. Like, you got to tell them what's going to happen before it happens, or what could happen. You have to play devil's advocate because if you don't, and then it comes back, and they're not expecting it, they're upset. They're upset at you potentially. Like, it just solves so, so many problems. So that is something the listing agent, they should always do that. If that was my it's list, list and I got a contingency that just said right. it was yeah. contingent upon the sale of property closing, I'd 100% counter back with that addendum. You know, the only way, well, okay, I say that. Let me give you a for example. I got an offer on a condo listing of mine on Friday. It was contingent upon a business that the guy's selling on Tuesday. And, and so we did Tuesday. put the first right refusal because now it did close. So now they're asking for an extension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, um, so we might put the container of one cell addendum in there now. I don't know. We just don't want to talk about that. But, um, um, but because it was so soon, it really didn't make sense to put the container of one cell addendum. But if it's, close, if it's closer to the, if it's already yeah. under contract and like it's, I would say if it's less than five days, someone would be tied the property. I mean, it's not so much, yeah. but I mean, it's tying the property up for five days is a lot different than tying the property for up for five weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, but you gotta get let the you gotta present the options to yourself and let them make decision. Yeah. Um, if you have a buyer that's interested in houses, um, if you have a buyer that's interested in a house in that's in probate, is the house is not listed? It is. Um, I mean, they just need to understand that probate can take months and months, and they gotta be patient. So and then, and then it depends on you know the judge depends on what the judge says more than likely it's fine. Judges know it's not fine. No big deal. But they just need to understand the yeah, the speed bumps that can come problem. up along the way. Huh? I don't even know they can list me because of the <clears throat> Sometimes the judge I can give them permission to right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they just probably know the bars. Yeah. That listing agent is going to know the details. Yeah. So they should. You they should. Yeah. You should call it. Yeah. Where it's at. So um, I think I've had one that closed while it was still in probate and the money went to the court to hold. Yeah. The to hold. yeah. yeah. Do you, uh, I think mean, this is an important question for everybody else. Do you set the expectations of what hour until you answer your phone with your console? Um, I probably don't uh, like I should, but my voicemail that sets the expectation and I'll literally have clients call me and they're like, Oh, it's 5.45. I know you, you know, you don't work after six. My voicemail says if it's after six, I'm like, I mean, it's not 30. My voicemail says if it's after six. Yeah, if it's at, well, one of my kids are, yeah, my son, you know, yeah, wrestling to the breakfast at 5.30. I mean, they're doing stuff. But um, I'll say if it's after 6 p.m., I'm spending time with my family. I'll work on your call the following day. Um, I don't set it in the consultation, but really I should. Yeah, and, and if I get text time. messages after, I won't respond to them. An easy way, I don't know if my sellers and guys know if buyers or forget sometimes, but an easy way of saying it is I ask them, when is it okay for me to call you? Oh, that's good. So I start it with them because if they're, they're like, oh, anytime after eight, and you know, we usually go, they'll tell me, you know, they go to sleep early or they wake up early and I'll say, okay, great, I'm with my family after this time. So unless it's important, you're there's, only going to get there's no a phone call yeah. around. I had yeah. one that got up early and he knew I he didn't know, but I did get up early and we would talk. Remember that? And I talked to him six months. Don't start it. Because <laughs> if you start it, don't keep it up. I was like in the last month, I think at six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I was like, are you kidding me? I was up, but I've been up. I could have answered the phone, but I was like, that's, that's, that's telling once, him that I'm available to get six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And I've talked to him in the story. Uh, it was funny at first. <laughs> After yeah, a while, you have to set your boundaries because if you don't, people will run yeah. over you. They will take advantage of your time and your life. And this this business, I mean, you know, oh, I've been 11 years. It'll eat your life if you let it. You know, so you just have to set those boundaries. It's your family. You're doing this for your family, ultimately, right? You don't ever show houses without a console, right? <sighs> Not unless it's somebody that like, in and they have like I've got some friends of mine. Um, I haven't done an official consult with them. We're going to look at a house today, but it, I, I know, I know them. Yeah, yeah. But um, for the most part, no. Do you get a lot of objections scheduling the appointment? No, it's just hey, it's and I'll tell them. And where I will get objections again, it's somebody's coming in for the weekend, like they want to look at twenty five condos. They want to buy a condo. Like, I don't want to waste time sitting in your office. And I just say to them, look, I promise you, I promise you, us spending 45 minutes in the office before we go look at the um, properties will save you time, headaches, frustration on the back end. Like, trust me on that. And do you still have the time to reach out? When that thing is face to face. Yeah. So you don't do virtual. I do. If so it's over true. Zoom, then I'll I'll not loop it to them. But yeah, I do um, virtual, uh, especially since COVID, I've done more virtual consultations. Um, so 
So you go in and, and that's it. that's the other solution. The people that are coming They're in for a very short it. amount of time, I'll say, okay, well, if you don't want to take the time, like, let's get on a phone call before you come into town mm -hmm. and um, do it. Some of that yeah. No, I was saying when you go in for the um with the recast, you just have the buyer agencies already. I have it all there filled out. Do you give them anything else in the buyer council? Do you have a packet that you give them, or is it just mainly a conversation in the two documents? No, um, I go back and forth on that because I believe I I have the value I offer is far above probably, and I'm. There are probably eighty percent of the agents in this market. There's a lot of really good agents, and so I go back and forth on that because I want to give them that value. Like they can take notes, and then I go, "Well, I should have some printed materials to give to them." But I don't know. I go back and forth on that, so I don't. I don't have anything that I give to them other than I give them a bio, and I have a nice little buyer letter I give to them. But maybe she doesn't do that because her stats are already. I mean, people well, know I, I was curious because a lot of agents do, but I personally, I mean, you are agents, like I, I would. Don't. And to I me, it's a conversation. Um, same with the listing. I guess very yeah. I, I mean, I just feel like the value it's a conversation I here. Yeah. And both, if though. they want that value, they need to take the time to sit down with me. Now, I will say as a newer agent, I did have like a listing presentation and I brought it. And what I realized is yeah. those people didn't even look at it. Yeah. And, but it was more my comfort. It was like yeah. more me having some. You don't have a listing presentation dish. It's, so, yeah. it's okay. Yeah, just it's the CMA it. kind of presentation together. But from a buyer's perspective, I don't have any materials mm -hmm. or anything that I give them. But it's funny, this morning I was coming in the office, I was thinking, I was like, I really should probably come up with some sort of marketing material, like something that looks really nice. That's like, um, I do so many condos, so I do a lot of condo buyer consultations. It's kind of like, the highlights of what we're going to talk about, right? And then a place for them to take notes. Yeah. Something like that would be nice, but um, I'll just add that to my list of things I need to do. <laughs> 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 so, anyway. so you find that it's probably cheesy to bring in paperwork. You should just have a conversation. No, I don't think it's cheesy at all. I would say if it were. If it works for you, do it. Yeah. So here's what I want to tell. Here's what you need to know. Okay. When you need, when you go into that consultation, you need to have 110 percent confidence okay. because they will see it. And if you're not confident, if you're not confident in the information you're providing to them in that conversation, and they see it or feel it, their trust level with you. I'm not saying they won't trust you, but it won't be the same, right? So if it if it helps you feel comfortable walk in with something. 100% do it. You'll get to a point there where you won't need it. Right. Yeah. I did used to have, so this, I did used to have slides and a, a notebook and I would go through it. And I just don't do it anymore because I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't need to. Yeah. So I would say you being new, you probably want something um, on paper or the, the stats, whatever it is. Um, but you just want to go into that meeting feeling super confident and that so that they see it. I do notice if I do bring stuff in though, um, like I feel like I get too much in my head. So it does help to like not have anything to rely on and just let the conversation flow. Yeah. yeah. Or like this like little points rather than well, a script say, because uh, then yeah, you're like you, I have to say everything word for word and I can't listen to it. No, not a script. Yeah. 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 But like you might want to have like look points like hey I've got a list of you know, this is this is what we're going to talk about today. And, you know, like just mm -hmm. for your yeah. like, so you don't get nervous and go, oh, I forgot to talk about that. Yeah, okay. yeah. That makes sense. I would rather do top five. Yeah, I'm a I'm like a high D. I gotta be a high D because this is this is the problem I'm having coming from corporate world into this world is that I want something done like, and I'm like, what what would we? Yeah. You already said you want to do this, so just let's just get it done. And that doesn't always happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think when you brought up the desk too, the more I think about it now, is a high C would maybe like a packet. Yeah. So it also could depend on the client oh, that buy something okay. that they can look at or they don't. So it's not bad to have them anyways. So, like for example, let's say that someone calls like on phone duty or immediate a buyer lead. So once you call them, you can be like, um, well, before we get start showing houses, I'd like for you to meet me or something. That's when you would do the buyer presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be the best way. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely before you show up. This is a safety thing, too. Mm -hmm. It's like calling up landlords. Yeah. Um, I'd say sometimes if they're calling on a listing, you, that's that's going to be your more difficult one to that's, have yeah. them mark. Um, but it could be value the house. It could be value. Yeah, they just want to see the house um, more than likely. Mm -hmm. But there's just groups out there, so that probably has to be processed. But, um, and if you if you feel comfortable, I've done this before, if I feel comfortable enough with them, but I couldn't really get them in the office, I'll say, okay, I'm going to show you this one home, and then can we agree that we'll sit down, okay. you know, to try to get them in the office after the show, I'll look at show them one more. Do you bring your showing agent and your buyer's agent to every appointment that they could be involved in? Yes. Can I Yes. Well, she has a team, so I asked if she brought her showing and you just leave it pretty yeah. clear that she's most likely going to be yeah here. so this is what i tell them like here's the thing i have Don, and we're a partnership and um we do things a little differently than what probably most agents you've worked with and yet it works really well for us and it it offers us it allows us to be able to offer you an even better level of service and so i focus and i'll tell them, i focus on the consultations kind of the preliminary um, information providing um, when you're ready to see properties. Dawn's going to step in. She's going to take you to see the properties. I'm still involved. I'm answering questions. Dawn's also answering questions. When you get ready to write that offer, you're coming back to me, and I'm handling everything from that point forward. And they're like, oh, okay. Um, I've only had one person that uh, basically fired us over the situation. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't want to work with that. Yeah. That's yeah. where we got those. <laughs> Kind of back to those like this. Um, I find that interesting. And <laughs> we do like that. Um, like, I'll use my son as an example. He's like life of the party, but yet he's at, getting ready to graduate from Auburn as a Ooh, business really? analyst. Oh. So he's very statistical, you know, data driven. So he's two. Combined. So you will have two. You will have two just profiles. You'll be high on two, and then you'll usually have a third trailer. And then you'll have one that you're not, or you might just have two, and the other two are really low. And we'll see if I can find a. Um, you know what? I have to pull mine up for show it to you. I was gonna say I like it a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, do you just make adjustments to? I can see him being like, you know, okay, so I know this person that like the party, and then all of a sudden yeah. he wants all this data, and you're like, oh. Well, so he's probably a high I and a high C, which usually don't really go together that well. So he's got something else in there that balances that out. Um, is he a real direct person? Or is he more like kind of steady? He can be a little bit skeptical of people. So he's probably a high C, a high I, and, and, and an S. And then he probably doesn't have a lot of tears. More than like, I'm not just for expert, but I've looked at him so I'm close to it. Right. No. I just I just did a global word along with that, but that's not so fast so here's one. Fast paced outspoken. Eyes are gonna be fast paced outspoken, but they're also gonna be accepting the warm. Deeds are not accepting the warm. Yeah, um, and eyes will I I want everybody to like them. Like they want everybody to like them. Yeah. Um, S's are going to be very accepting of where they're going to be very cautious and reflective. And then C's are going to be more, uh, well, and these are questioning and skeptical. And then C's are going to be questioning and skeptical, but they're going to be cautious and reflective as well. Um, and do people's discs will change yeah. over time. <coughs> yeah. Season of life yeah. or a thing. Yeah, I know. You know, well, yeah. they give you an adaptive and a natural style, which is kind of interesting yes. to see that you're. Yeah, so when you take it, um, the able symbol that you do, which is the natural, it's like, yeah. like naturally who you are. But whenever you take it, um, you're supposed to like think of yourself at work, I think is what they said. But you'll have the, the natural and then you'll have the adaptive. Adaptive is like how you're going to kind of change your personality a little bit when you're at work or in a, in a um, formal type setting. So if you had, like, and he came in for a console. You know, do you, can you say, oh, this guy is, you know, funny, like the party, and then all of a sudden he's going to tell me this data. Do you, you just make the adjustments or, or 
can you like lose somebody if you're going one way and, and they're well going. yeah you you could if, if you let's say um let's say you have somebody that's a high c and they want a lot of data you're not getting them the data they want they're not going to trust you they're going to move on yeah um and and this, the flip side of that is if somebody that's a high d and they just want like just give you the bottom line and you're like trying to like give them like let's say you're a high c and you like the data you're trying to give them all this they don't care they want the bottom line that's all they want yeah. Um, and you might lose them a little bit. But the usually the D is going to tell you. They're going to say, I don't want that. Tell me <laughs> sort of the bottom line. Yeah. They're going to tell you. Yeah. Because they're really great. Yeah. <coughs> my high C and my I and my D. Really? So I'm a high D, high I. I have no S. And my C, so there's a 50% line, right? So yeah. my D, the last, I just took it a month and a half ago. My D was like, 90 something, my C, my I was like 80 something, or maybe my D was like 89, and then I was a little bit less. S is down there. And then my C is usually like somewhere around a 50% line, a little low, maybe a little low. We'll have to take a number now. When I first started real estate, I was the free Tony Robinson, and I was like off the chart C. But I was feeling very insecure about what I was doing, and like I was just learning about real estate, and so that's how I. It was a free one too, but that's how I showed up at the high C, um, because of just where I was in, in life. When you compare <coughs> the Jitters, the new age of Jitters, when did you get over it? I mean, I would say six months. Then you should start. Wouldn't you say six months start feeling some confidence? Um, once you get a few transactions under your belt, so every I, think that's like a bit yeah. I would say it probably took me about two years to feel like really confident. Yeah, but it wasn't that long to feel comfortable. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Just think it. That's why you're saying it. Yeah, you already are confident. I don't think you have to worry about it. <laughs>